Hey everyone, this is Devin with HDB. Today, I'm here to walk you through one of our example apps. This is an event management API built in the Python Fast API framework. API consumers can fetch, create, update, and delete both events and users over HTTP. If you want to work along, you'll find a link in the video's description to our step-by-step -step guide that will take you through this entire build. If you'd prefer to just look at the code or even to run a copy and see how it works for yourself, I'll also provide a link to our examples repository so that you can do those. Now, let's dig into the code. I have opened the example project here in my code editor, and I want to first draw your attention over to the sidebar, and I'll take you through some of the different parts of the app. The bulk of the app happens inside the app folder, as you might expect. I've got a few files here. I've got users, main, and events. If we go into main, this is where we actually create the server application and bring in the routers from our individual modules. So we've got an events router to control fetch, create, update, and delete for events. And then we've got something similar for users. I'll dig into those endpoints a little bit later. But first, I want to show you I've got the DB schema directory here. That comes from creating an EdgeDB project with EdgeDB space project space init. That sets up an instance, a database, and it creates this DB schema directory. It creates a migrations directory, and it sets you up with this default .esdl where you can start writing your schema. I'll also come back to that a little bit later. Most of the rest of the stuff you see in here is not super important to the project. I do have my VENV, which is a virtual environment dedicated to this project which the guide will show you how to create if you want to go through this on your own. And then I have this edgedb.toml file, which also gets created when I run edgedb project init. And this defines the server version we're running with edgedb for this project. Let's go back to the schema and dig into that a little bit deeper. The first thing I have here is an abstract type. That just means that I can't create objects of this type. This is only to be inherited by other object types, concrete types. This one is auditable, and it gives us a created at property, which is a date time, and that's going to be initialized using this date time current function. Scrolling down a little bit, I've got two concrete types. I've got user and I have event. Both of those extend auditable, which means they'll both get that created at property, but then they also have their own properties. The user has a name, which is a string. It's going to be exclusive, which means there's not going to be any name overlap amongst users, and it's also going to have a maximum length of 50. The event has a name as well with those same two constraints, but then it also has an address, which is a string, a schedule, which is a date time, and it's going to link back to a user which is going to be that event's host. Let's go into users.py because that is our simplest set of endpoints. And while we're looking at these, just to give us more room, I'm going to collapse that sidebar. Most of this here at the top is just importing various things that we need. Here we have the EdgeDB client binding for Python. We also have our fast API framework, and we're bringing in some functions out of that. These imports from queries, let's go back to the sidebar for just a second and pop open this queries directory. These are all the queries that our application will need to run. What we do is we can create these as EdgeQL files, and then we just write the query directly into that EdgeQL file. Let me find a simpler one so that it's easier to see what's happening here. This is the get users query. It's just the query that you would type out at the EdgeDB console, but we can run a generator. Once we've installed the EdgeDB Python library, that gives us a command line generator that we can invoke with EdgeDB-Py. That's going to search through our project for any of these .edgeql files and generate type-safe Python code from those files. 
back over in our users file or users module, those generated files are what we're importing right here. The files that were generated from our user queries. Now here we've got to create a fast API router and we've also got to set up our asynchronous EdgeDB client. This request data class just models the data that we're going to take when we're doing things to other users like updating them or deleting them. But as you're going to see a little bit later, the rest of our typing comes out of that generated code. We can see an example of that in this first endpoint, the get users endpoint. Get users is going to take a name optionally and it's going to return either a list of the type generated from this query, get users async edgeql. Get users result is the type that's going to come out of that query. Same thing down here for this alternative that we're using in the union here. The function might return a list of those get users results, or it might just return a single get user by name result from that query. And if I hover over those, you can see the type. Get users result has an ID that is a, a UUID, it has a name that's a string, and it has a created at that is a date time. Then we've just got some simple logic here for how to handle the request. If there's no name, then we're just grabbing all the users. So we're running this get users function that was generated from our get users query that I showed you earlier. In the else case, which means we did get a name, then instead we're using get user by name, that function instead that's based on that other query. Let me show you that one just so you can see what that looks like. It's pretty much the same except it also has a filter on the name parameter. Let's collapse that sidebar again. Also take note that I've got some exception handling here. If the username that our API consumer gives us doesn't map to an actual user, then we need to raise this not found exception. So it's going to send back a 404 with this JSON that has this error message in it. The rest of these functions are pretty similar, except they're going to be calling different query functions. So this one calls create user. This is the put endpoint. So it is calling update user instead. And it has a couple of different ways that we can throw an exception here. We can throw an exception if someone's trying to change one user to a name that already exists on another user, or they're trying to change a user that we can't find a user for. Similar thing here for delete users. You can have either of those two exceptions, but otherwise it's, it's very similar. You're just calling a different function and returning a different type. Let's check out what is going on here in the events module. Pretty much the same thing at the top. The request data looks a little bit different because the events are a little bit more complicated than the users. The endpoints are very similar. On the get endpoint, you can either pass in a name or you can not pass a name and we'll give you everything. If you pass a name and there's no event under that name, then we're going to give you a 404. The post endpoint looks pretty much like you would expect. It does have an additional exception that you could throw here. You might have someone who passes in a schedule that's not a date time string that you can convert into anything. So then you're going to throw that bad request that's going to be a 400. Or of course, you could have someone trying to create a, an event with a name that already exists. Updating events, no real surprises here. The same kinds of things you could have happen in the post event. The delete endpoint, no real surprises here. Just an exception if we don't find it. Otherwise, we delete it and return it. And that's really the whole app. I think you can see how the code generation both makes it easier to hook your app into your database, but also gives you end-to-end -end type safety from the app to the database. This is going to make your apps easy to build, but also easier to maintain in the long run. If this looks interesting to you, again, Check out our guide and try to build it yourself, or go off and try to build your own API. If you have any problems, we'd love it if you'd join us in our Discord channel. I'll put a link to that also in the description.
and make sure you subscribe to the channel where we'll be releasing more videos like this one to help you build awesome software with HDB. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.